Live from Boston, where it's currently 75 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy, my name is Emilio Madrigal, <laughs> and welcome to this edition of PathCast. Today is Tuesday, July 2, and I am joined by my colleague Rifat Manan from UPenn and Dr. Fausto Rodriguez from Johns Hopkins, where he will continue his Neuropath lecture series. This is the fifth session of the current lecture series titled Ependymal Tumors and the eighth Neuropath lecture for PathCast, Pathcast overall by Dr. Dr. Rodriguez. As always, please feel free to post your comments and questions in the Facebook and YouTube chat windows, and Rafa and I will make sure to pass those questions along to Dr. Rodriguez at the end of the session. So with that, I will now turn the microphone over to Dr. Rodriguez. All right. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for a very important topic in uh, surgical neuropathology, which is that of uh, ependymal tumors. So let, just to give you a, a clarification of the WHO updates and actually uh, entities that are recognized in the WHO of ependymal tumors, uh, and this is the list really, uh, subependymoma, mixopapillary ependymoma, several morphologic subtypes of ependymoma. Uh, there is a new addition, which is the, in 2016 at least, which is, has a molecular component which which is these ependymomas with rela fusion and anaplastic ependymomas of course as we continue to learn more about the genetics of ependymoma we'll see that there are some categories that are also going to start making this list uh in uh, uh, in this uh, paper which has been uh, quoted uh, very frequently in which there was a comprehensive uh, study of uh, ependymomas at, or ependymal tumors at all different sites. There were nine distinct subgroups uh, identified uh, with two of them, the P, uh, pro, uh, posterior fossa group A and RELA being the ones associated with uh, the highest mortality and actually driving most of the mortality associated with ependymomas as I'm going to show you. These are the nine groups, and uh, something that you can take of this is a bit, a bit complex, but the purpose of this uh, slide is to tell you um, that, show you that ependymomas, depending on where they are, they are different. So a supratentorial ependymoma is very different from one that occurs in the spinal cord, and the same, uh, uh, so, and the same goes for posterior fossa. So those are the three different compa compartments that are important to have in mind, supratentorial, posterior fossa, and ependymomas also tells you that ependymomas can occur throughout the uh, neural axis. So it's something uh, uh, important to have in mind, and sometimes even uh, outside uh, you know, in, in other ectopic sites like uh, 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 the mediastinum and soft tissues, perisacral soft tissues. This is a bit of a summary also from the same paper showing you the different uh, associations with genetics, tumor locations, and age uh, distribution. With that, we'll start with the first case uh, in uh, which now they are all available uh, online. So feel free to access them as we go or uh, later on, on your own, uh, at your own convenience. First case is a 29 year old uh, man with increasing headaches and had uh, this mass in the left lateral ventricle at le near the foramen of Monroe. So a few of the demographics here uh, can be very helpful in, in evaluating this uh, tumor. This is the slide. And you can see at low power that this is in some very eosinophilic. So you probably are de dealing with something that is favorable. Nodular. This is something that is another feature of ependymal neoplasms. They tend to be nodular. And actually, this is a diagnosis that uh, we say in surgical neuropathology is a, is, is a one second diagnosis. And it's a diagnosis that you make a low power. And is uh, this, the features that are, you're highlighting here is this clustering of this round to oval nuclei, not much variation. Uh, and this clustering of very nice glial background and with a lot of nodularity. And that in an adult, in an intraventricular location, this all these features should point you in the differ in the diagnosis of subependymoma. An important diagnosis because it's a favorable tumor, it has they, these tumors grow very, very slow and they are curable by resection and even by partial resection, they may st start as uh, be inactive for, for long periods of time. If you go on high power, the cells are round to oval. Uh, so you see how why here you can get uh, misled by the, the high power here. If this could be essentially 
just looking at it could look like any other uh, glioma. You can even start thinking about things like oligoendoglioma, pyrocytic astros, etc. The key here is the low power. It gives you the architecture. It's, it's very distinctive. These clusters with a lot of spaces, you can pick this up in frozen section. Smears, they don't smear well. There's something to have in mind. You have very uh, glial background and these the smears usually they smear in clusters so it's not a the smears don't help you very much the frozen sections are very telling and you can make this diagnosis in frozen section uh, a few other features that you occasionally see are these microcysts and these are more common in the sub ependymomas that occur in the lateral ventricles so the ones that are in the lateral ventricles tend to have this microcyst. Uh, some of them occur, of course, in the posterior fossa, and those, that feature is less uh, represented. You can occasionally have also pleomorphism, mitotic activity to a limited degree. Uh, those features are still compatible if the, uh, with a diagnosis of subependymoma. In contrast to ependymal tumors, you don't have much for uh, pseudorosettes. So that's something to have in mind. So the diagnosis here is subependymoma WHO grade one. Okay, and I'm going to show you just uh, by comparison, another case that uh, illustrates this. You see areas like this at low power and this is a, a, a total different uh, patient. So, you see something that reminds you of a subependymoma. You can say this this field I can tell you is a subependymoma, and we can most agree that there is clustering, a lot of this glial background, very typical of subependymoma. Um, but some hellenized vessels, calcifications, all those features are compatible with the same diagnosis. But what we're starting to see is areas that are a little bit more cellular, and when you start seeing some good pseudorosettes. This increased cellularity. Here as well. And here as well, particularly here. So this is an issue that uh, we tend to see in uh, consults because you have this area here that actually looks to you like a, an ependymoma in other areas that look as subependymoma. So in these cases, uh, the criteria are not well established, but uh, many of these can be approached uh, as a mixed subependymoma ependymoma. And I tend to provide in the report a relative uh, uh, a percentage of the of the different components and actually try to say that this for example in and also highlight the component that predominates in this case the subependymoma predominates a little bit so i try to reflect that in the reports trying to convey the the the, the idea that this is a very low grade tumor certainly there's an ependymal component to it but probably this is going to uh, uh, behave in a, in a favorable fashion this has very little proliferation um, but you do have an unquestionable ependymal component in addition to the subependymoma. So it's something just to have in mind. And again, the criteria are not well established, but my feeling is that this being so low grade architecturally has a lot of the features of subependymoma that probably will behave in a similar fashion. But you really have to highlight the presence of a more conventional ependymal component. All right, let's move to the case two of the virtual slides. This is a 43-year-old woman. And this is the MRI of this patient. You have a T2, with a, a sagittal image that shows this hyperintensity in the cervical region. This is a T1 pre-contrast, and this is a T1 post-contrast, and you can see that there's some enhancement there. So it's a, a well-circumscribed enhancing mass in the cervical region. You can see why many of these tumors, even if they are low grade, they can be problematic because they are located in a very key uh, part of the CNS that is, it can have some challenges with surgery. Now, something about ependymal tumors is that they are 
good surgical uh, problems in a sense that they can be resected completely, even when they are located in areas that you may be surprised uh, that uh, they're amenable for resection along the, the length of the spinal cord, for example. They're very circumscribed tumors, so these are predominantly in the spinal cord surgical problems. All right, so we'll go to the next to the slide. So this is the slide that you have. And again, at low power, you can see it's very lobular. This is another, it's a feature that is consistent in many of the ependymal neoplasms, but a bit more cellular at low power than the first case, right? So you start seeing here, you do have seems you're seeing some spaces and some spaces around the vessels. That is one of the most common features that uh, drags you to the diagnosis of an ependymal tumor is these pseudorosets, and this is caused by tumor cell processes that go into the vessel wall. That's one of the most common features. It's not exclusive of ependymoma, but when you see it to a large extent, uh, it is. Uh, the feature that you helps you the most to make that diagnosis. So you can see here spaces. It's, this tumor is relatively cellular, but uh, the proliferation is not that high. Again, you continue moving around. And see it, it, a lot of the glial background. And you see in areas, the cellular rosettes are not always in, in all areas. So it's something to have in mind that you have to really look around in these tumors um, and you will find areas that you're more convincingly uh, ependymoma. But circumscription, nodularity, pseudorosets, these are, these are some good ones. So basically, this is also something that is easy to recognize in frozen section. You have a low power, this space around the vessels, which is basically made, again, by glial processes. And those are the pseudorosets. Again, not much for mitotic activity or other um, issues and the diagnosis here is ependymoma and this is your what you consider your conventional ependymoma which is starts at a grade two and there are a few uh, things uh, items I want to discuss with you. One of them is the value of the um, uh, smear and frozen sections. Frozen sections are easy in ependymomas because they are relatively solid tumors, so you can do that. But also, uh, a particular you in in some of these uh, tumors from the spinal cord, you may get before the full resection the a piece of it uh, because the of course the surgeon is going to be very aggressive in resecting these tumors and they probably would like to confirm that with a frozen section and you may get a piece that is smaller and the spinal cord again very you cannot take as very too much tissue so you may get a smear and smears are extremely useful in the evaluation of ependymomas you can see here this is one ependymoma a smear uh, with some epithelioid cells. You see the variation is not uh, as much as you see in other tumors. They are glial tumors. So, so some of the cytologic features are those of a glial tumors, but they tend to have, they have some processes, eosinophilic cytoplasm, but 
the, the, not to the extent that you will see, for example, with an astrocytoma, okay? So they look a little bit more epithelioid. They have this hybrid nature of epithelioid features, but also uh, glial features. And that's something that is reflected in the smears. This is another smear. Now, something that is another feature that is highly characteristic, not only the individual cells, the features of the individual cells, but it's these uh, arc-like aggregates around vessels. That is the cytologic counterpart of the pseudorosette. The cells stay clinging to these vessels in the smear, in the smearing process. That is something that right away is highly characteristic for ependymoma. You can always see in these areas, these arc-like, many times, arrangements and uh, surrounded by these glial cells, almost that these cells don't want to let go. And you can, it, it shows you nicely the processes that these pseudorosets are really made of these glial processes. So some of the features for intraoperative uh, evaluation that can be very helpful. This is a nice one here. You can see actually sometimes the Hesudoros had very nicely outlined here. You can see that the processes uh, or the spaces that you see around the vessels are really made by cells, uh, the cell, the, the processes of the individual cells. That is your pseudorosette, your ependymal pseudorosette. Now, as I mentioned, the pseudorosets is what you tend to see. This is another case, a very separate case in which the pseudorosets are even better developed. You can have a lot of spaces around the vessels and when you see a lot of these. And you can confirm this with stains. I'm going to show you stains in the context of other cases. But you can see these are strongly GFAP positive. Sometimes your ependymoma, the cells themselves are variably GFAP positive, but these pseudorosets, when well developed, that's where you see the bulk of the GFAP positivity. It's made of these glial processes, and they're highlighted very nicely by the GFAP. Here you go. Now, as I mentioned, the pseudorosets are not the most specific feature for ependymomas. Uh, they are specific, of course. They allow, you, they allow you for the diagnosis when everything is there. When you have a lot of them in a circumscribed neoplasm, everything fits. Yes, you can make the diagnosis based on that. But pseudorosets can occur in other tumors, uh, particularly neurocytic tumors. Uh, in those cases, the, the pseudorosets are actually made of neuronal processes. So they are synaptophysin positive and GFAP negative. And, but in also some, you can see areas that resemble ependymoma even in, in glioblastomas and other uh, conventional gliomas. Uh, so that is something to have in mind. This is another case, and you can see this case has a little bit more cellularity, increased cellularity, but again, a low power. You're seeing all these spaces around the vessels. You have a vessel in the center and cells around it. Very cellular, very nodular. Again, we are dealing with an ependymoma. You can have necrosis in ependymoma. That's something that is not uncommonly seen. Uh, it's not as uh, it's not really associated as much with prognosis as all, as in contrast to the diffuse gliomas. You know, uh, a necrosis and a diffuse astro and oligo they are worrisome features. They tend to be associated with a more aggressive behavior. In ependymomas, you can have a coagulative necrosis like this, and really, it's not the the most. You might want to note it in your report, but by itself. It's not the most, um, uh, it's the prognostic significance is not high when you take everything else into account.
Now, so another feature that you're seeing in this piece are these. Now, this is absolutely specific for ependymal differentiation. When you see this in a tumor like this, this is more specific than the pseudo rosettes. These are two rosettes. And you can see here you have a vessel or, well, here, this may be a slightly more of a pseudo rosette, but here you have evidence of ependymal differentiation. This is when they're long like this, sometimes these are known as ependymal canals. When they're smaller, you can call them ependymal uh, rosettes. These are true ependymal rosettes and canals. And this is absolutely specific for the diagnosis. You don't see it in every case. They are not as common as the pseudo rosettes. But when you see them in a tumor that has these features of a, of a glial neoplasm, you're considering a pendimoma and you see this, this is essentially diagnostic. You don't see this in diffuse gliomas. Uh, you don't see that in very many tumors. So they can be long. You can see all these ependyma. You have to make sure that you're not dealing with the, the lining of the ventricle, which may be an issue for some of the intraventricular examples. But it's another feature that makes you think uh, of that is absolutely diagnostic in the right context for ependymoma. All right, we'll move to the next case. She's a 31 year old woman with back pain. And this is what we have another tumor in the lower spine and the lumbar region. You can see here, this is your sagittal T2 and you see some of the nerve roots coursing through here and this very nicely circumscribed neoplasm. This is actually the same as this one. These are the same for whatever reason. But here's the T1 that shows some uh, enhancement of this tumor. Very well circumscribed. As you see, it's not really in the substance of the cord. It's really uh, associ it's associated with some of the, uh, of the probably nerve roots or the film terminale, which is a code word for, for this. And this is case number three again. This is the slide. Very bloody. So some some of these tumors actually can look very bloody and, and almost red at the uh, gross and their gross appearance. We can go on high power. And you can again start seeing cell processes ending up in these vessels, similar to the tumors that we were seeing. These are pseudorosettes. What is different here is that the cell, the vessel walls, I mean, there's a lot of hyalinization. And also you start seeing all this myxoid stroma, some of that is making microcysts. Some of it is actually in the vessel walls, surrounding the vessel walls in between the processes, in between these tumor cell processes. This is highly characteristic for this tumor. So there are a lot of features here that are helpful. You can see here even better, some of these cell processes going to the vessels, to these hyalinized vessels. And a lot of these cysts. So this is a myxopapillary ependymoma. It's something that occurs very, at this site almost always, kind of distal spinal cord uh, in association with the phylum terminale, occasionally with some of the nerve roots. Uh, these tumors actually can occur also in the soft tissues unassociated with, with the spine. And, but when you have it in the spinal cord, uh, and uh, these are typically WHO grade, by definition, WHO grade one tumors. The differential may be wide. The differential includes a metastatic adenocarcinoma, particularly when you see a lot of these microcysts, they can simulate gland formation. 
chordoma also, which tends to have a, a, a mixoid stroma as well. Those are the two major uh, differential diagnoses. But again, this is highly this mixoid stroma. Again, this almost always occurs at the distal uh, spinal cord, with very few exceptions. Show you some of the stains. This is GFAP, same case. Again, at low power, something that is very useful in a pendinal tumors with GFAP, as I mentioned, you see this uh, positivity around the vessels. It's, there's a very nice stain to highlight those pseudo sets. The cell in, in between can be variable. They can be altogether negative, actually. Um, but um, you can convince yourself that around these vessels, you have some, some GFAP staining. It's one, of, it's one of the key immunohistochemical features of uh, ependymal tumors. And here you have the Ki67 in this case documenting a low proliferation. There's some stuff there in the blood, but a very tumor that has a low proliferative index. So This is, a, a, as I mentioned, mixopapillary ependymoma is a WHO grade one tumor. However, you occasionally have tumors that behave in a more aggressive fashion, particularly when they have been partially resected. So if these tumors have to be uh, resected and blocked, they try to not spill it. If they, if you spill the content, sometimes you can have a lot of seeding of the spinal cord. So it's something to have in mind, as I mentioned, Many times before in this uh, in this uh, lecture series, uh, even grade one tumors can cause a lot of harm. So it depends a lot of on on the extent of resection and uh, other biologic properties of the tumor. For example, this is a case that I recently saw in another case in consult, and you can see this was an inguinal lymph node. And of course, your first temptation is to call these some sort of probably metastatic carcinoma. But the patient had a history, actually, of a partially resected uh, mixopapillary ependymoma of the spine. And you can see here, great pseudorosets. Again, the pseudorosets, you have a, a, the vessel, you have these mixoid stroma, and then you have the cell processes around. That's highly characteristic of the pseudorosets of, of mixopapillary ependymoma. And here are some of the stains. So you have the GFAP as well. This is a GFAP positive tumor highlighting those pseudo sets again. So this is actually a mix of papillary ependymoma that didn't have any other um, evidence of uh, malignancy other than it was metastasizing. And that happens. That really happens. It can happen with these tumors. Now, there's a concept coming up now of uh, mix of papillary ependymomas that are uh, anaplastic by other criteria, that they have risk mitotic activity. There is a recent paper from uh, the UCSF group studying this phenomenon, and they, they are convincing tumors that are anaplastic, and they are you really want to see risk mitotic activity in these tumors. Having a few mites is okay in a conventional grade one mix of popular epidemiology, but when you, you start seeing risk mitotic activities and other features of malignancy, certainly an anaplastic uh, designation is more, more appropriate. One more differential diagnosis of uh, anaplastic uh, ependymoma, or mixo, I'm sorry, mixopapillary ependymoma, is something else that we occasionally see in, consult in our consultation practice, and it's this entity here. This is another tumor that was located in the phylum terminale, and you see a low power, 
you can argue there are some cis, and there is a, a suggestion of pseudosets as well. And these uh, oftentimes uh, puzzles um, pathologists. And is you see this, you have a vessel, you can say, well, there's a pseudoroset. It looks like an ependymoma, but something that's not quite right. The pseudorosets are not well uh, well formed. Uh, there is some uh, hallucination around a little bit. Circumscribed tumor, phallum terminale. And this is actually a paraganglioma of the phallum terminale. It's another important differential diagnosis. It's relatively rare, but it does occur there. It, it occurs in the phylum and is oftentimes mistaken for mixopapular ependymoma, which is a, a more frequent uh, tumor that you will encounter in that region. But these tumors also occur in the same location. The immunostains are very typical, of course. You will not have here GFAP. You will have uh, expression of neuroendocrine markers. Uh, synaptophysin, chromogranin, and that's what many times ends up uh, triggering the reassessment of the diagnosis. So this is a paraganglium of the phylum. Some of these can have ganglion cell differentiation, which can you know, lead to more diagnostic uh, issues, and they frequently express keratins. That's something else to have in mind. You don't have to call these a, a neuroendocrine carcinomas. In the phylum, Paragangliomas frequently express keratin, and can be very strong sometimes. So, um, so you, uh, this is another diagnosis to have in mind when you're in the phylum. Not very common, but uh, definitely is a, a tumor that uh, also occurs at this location and can be mistaken for mixopapillary ependymoma. So mixopapillary ependymoma, WHO grade one, was the diagnosis. Let's move into no, case number four, 39 year old man with an intradural lumbar tumor. All right, so we are again seeing a theme of ependymal tumors. You see how frequent these features are, and are these pseudorosets. When you start seeing that, you have to at least think of ependymoma as a very uh, high possibility. Here, it looks like you see you have this fibrillary background. In many of these uh, tumors, pieces. Now, what is striking about this is, of course, the pleomorphism, and that's the point of this case. You have these large pleomorphic giant cells. You move around, there's not that much proliferation, so this is something that you see in many tumor types in the CNS. You can have pleomorphism, uh, and on their own, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a bad tumor. And actually, this type of pleomorphism, you can encounter this sometimes in some of these uh, spinal cord ependymomas. You can see they can be fairly large, but you see we're not seeing much for proliferation, right? more of this pleomorphism. That's the highlight of this tumor. Some cysts. More cysts here. A lot of cell processes, again, very conspicuous pseudorosets. sets. 
So the diagnosis here is giant cell ependymoma, and it is not a uh, entity that is uh, it's not necessarily considered an entity in the WHO. It's not. It doesn't have a separate category. It's something, but however, important to have in mind because you can encounter this in the spinal cord, and you can as a in in, a, in your practice, and this can lead to a, a wide group of differential diagnosis. Really doesn't have any prognostic implications, just that it's a, it's a pattern that is important to recognize as being okay for happening in, the, in an ependymoma if the other features are there. The immunophenotype here was very similar to other ependymomas, so we were able to call it ependymoma, giant cell ependymoma. If you want to be more of a purist, you can just call it ependymoma with giant cell features. Uh, occasionally, you may have just a few cells that are giant, and you can probably, it's better to approach it that way. Uh, and again, this is, uh, you will grade it as you will grade any other ependymomas. But just be aware that you can have significant pleomorphism in ependymomas as in other low grade tumors of the CNS. Case number five is a 71 year old man that had a spinal cord mass. You see some calcifications here. Going back to low power, you do have a suggestion of a nodular architecture. And again, you do have pseudorosettes. The rosettes here. Now, see something that is different for, for this tumor compared to the other ones that I've shown you is that the cells are fairly spindle. Fairly spindle. Sometimes even you can have uh, envision the formation of fascicles. Very nice spindle cell architecture. And then a suggestion of pseudo rosettes. Pseudo rosettes here as well. Here you almost have a formation of a herringbone pattern almost. Not perfect, de perfectly developed, but this is the main characteristic here is that you have a spindle cell neoplasm with pseudo rosettes. Here is the GFAP, and you can see the tumor is GFAP positive. And you can argue it's kind of regional positivity and accentuated around vessels in some areas. So a lot of diagnoses were considered here, but this was a very circumscribed lesion in intermedullary mass, and the diagnosis was ependymoma. with tannicidic features. Again, WHO grade 2, this was not highly proliferative. Um, and this is a diagnosis that is a little tricky because uh, it gets abused a little bit. Uh, it, it's, there's a temptation to call these when you have a tumor that looks uh, very spindle. Uh, this one had some features, uh, so we uh, interpret it as uh, with tannicidic features, uh, which is okay. 
you grade as you grade other tumors, you know, uh, the specific variant here is not as critical as uh, having the grade right. But I tend to reserve this in colon tannicidic tumor uh, ependymoma to those tumors that when you see it, you have a, a difficulties in separating them from a mesenchymal neoplasm or from a schwannoma or a nerve sheath tumor. Those are the ones, it, it helps you in the differential diagnosis, particularly when the tumor in recurrent tumors, when it, it, if you establish it very well for the beginning, it can keep you out of trouble for tumors that occur later. So again, grading is the same, same criteria, but we have served these to tumors that give you a, make a diagnostic challenge and make are difficult to distinguish from other uh, spindle cell neoplasms. Having a tumor centered in the spinal cord proper is helpful because ependymoma is the most common primary uh, neoplasm of, of the spinal cord in adults. But uh, that's when you tend to use it. And again, you can use a lot of comments in your in your practice in which you say there are some features uh, that resemble that or you know, or tiny city features that are different ways of conveying the same message. Again, the more important things here is the, 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 the grading that you will have. This was a very low grade neoplasm. Okay, let's move into case number six. Uh, this is a five-year-old boy uh, with worsening neck pain had a history of resection of a posterior fossa ependymoma. And came now with uh, some changes in the imaging. And now you see something in the spinal cord, this mass actually that is compressing the cord and uh, with uh, enhancement. And this is a tumor here. And you can see you are, there are pseudorosets, multiple pseudorosets everywhere. So it certainly, epidemiology must be considered. It's very cellular, it's very blue. So the differential diagnosis here is where the first differential diagnosis in a child is an embryonal tumor, some sort of uh, embryonal tumor like medulloblastoma, particularly with that history of a posterior fossa mass, uh, what used to be called PNET in the past, but we are not using that term anymore. So something embryonal or neuronal has to be entertained. And, and those tumors can have also pseudorosets. Now, if you go on high power, it's very blue, and you start seeing also brisk mitotic activity. Pretty much, they are not easy, they're difficult to find. You see them in many different fields, multiple fields with multiple mitosis. That is extremely concerning in an ependymal tumor. Apoptotic bodies, some of them, but mitotic, mitotic activity is not difficult to find here. Cellular tumor, mitotic figures. So this is uh, anaplastic, it's malignant, independent of what we end up calling, okay? And I'm gonna show you some stains. First stain is OLIC2. And we use OLIC2 a lot as a marker of gliomas. It's not present in every case, but it's relatively sensitive and, and relatively specific for uh, glial tumors. And they are, ependymomas are uh, almost always negative for OLIC2. You may have a few rare cells entrapped, but it's one of the first uh, stains that we use to uh, screen. So ependymomas, um, 
are usually are DFIP positive as astrocytic tumors and other astrocytomas or in gliomas, but they are all two negative for the most part, like this case show. Here's your GFAP. And again, you start seeing that the GFAP is positive in a subset of cells, but particularly positive around those pseudorosettes. So GFAP positivity and other tumor cells tend to be, are here strongly positive. So you are, it is helpful to start going in that direction. This is EMA. And this was negative in this case as well. EMA, you see it as a, another marker specific for, relatively specific for ependymomas, uh, but you don't always have it, particularly in cellular, uh, more uh, poorly differentiated neoplasms. This is the KI67. which goes with the mitotic activity, it's very high. So we are feeling very comfortable that this is an anaplastic tumor. A lot of K67. And now a more recent marker. This is um, uh, an antibody that recognizes H3K27 trimethylation, okay? It's an epigenetic marker. And you can see here that it is lost in tumor cells and preserved in vessels. So you have loss of H3K27 trimethylation. So what does that mean in this context? Well, this uh, is an immunohistochemical surrogate of the molecular subgroup type A of the posterior fossa ependymomas in children. These are, this is not something that is still yet for part of the WHO, but it eventually probably will be, because you have two groups. You have the subgroup A and the subgroup B, and the tumors that are aggressive and that drive the mortality in, in these patients are usually the subgroup A. These are based in methylation and gene expression groups, but one nice surrogate for it is this H3K27 trimethylation loss. So it's a, it's a very useful marker for these. And as you can see, this tumor was behaving in an aggressive fashion, started in the posterior fossa and had this independent tumor there in the spine that almost certainly is just dissemination uh, of the neoplasm. Let's move to the next case, case seven. 26 year old woman had weakness and numbness of the left uh, body and had a 4.7 centimeter right frontal lobe mass. So this is a supratentorial ependymoma. So the rosettes are evident in this case. So again, we are probably dealing with a, a neoplasm, an ependymal neoplasm. And this is a great field to, work, to, to focus on. So you have the pseudo rosettes. And there's several different uh, possibilities there, but ependymoma, of course, again, being in this the theme, ependymoma is one of the leading uh, concerns here. What is different here about the tumor cells is that you have some cytoplasmic clearing. 
um, which sometimes is reminiscent of a oligoendoglial neoplasm. You do have mitotic activity, but you have a lot of cytoplasm cytoplasmic clearing. Let's look at other um, features. This is the GFAP, so you know that you're dealing with a glial tumor. Here, the cells, in this particular case, for whatever reason, you do have more staining with, with GFAP. And this is EMA. And if you look at this kind of quickly, you may conclude that it is negative. So you start seeing things like this, little dots. little dots like this in between cells. Dots, dots. Dots. And other dots here. So this is a marker, of course, of, of ependymomas in, in the right context. Of course, you want to make sure that everything else is there. But dot like positivity for EMA is uh, fairly characteristic. And here you have a field in which you have much more of that. So in some cells, you can have actually surface, actual surface staining. So this is really uh, another property of, of ependymomas. Sometimes, depending on how strong uh, the EMA is in your practice, you may it may be negative, uh, and so it's just something to have in mind. Another marker that can help you in that situation is um, CD99. It also it can be a positive in ependymomas, and also can give you a similar pattern of staining. In this case, in particular. the CD99 actually was more sensitive and it was showing a lot of these uh, dot light positivity and in intercells. This is even cleaner than the, the EMA. So in this case, the CD99, so sometimes I do them together. I do EMA and I do CD99 because in, in my experience, the CD99 tends to be more uh, sensitive in ependymomas. But you can see here, this is what you're, you're seeing here, these nice little intercellular dots that actually corresponds to intercellular lumina. And another marker that for this supertentorial ependymomas is that we use uh, sometimes is cycling D1. And cycling D1 is positive here, strongly positive. And cycling D1 tends to be as frequently expressed in uh, the ependymomas that have Herrera fusion. Now, so the Herrera fusion is difficult to test for. You need uh, specific uh, NGS platforms or fish for them. So you know if you don't have it, uh, you can actually uh, something that we occasionally do is use a surrogate. We stain for cycling D1, and if it's strongly positive, you can at least make a suggestion in your diagnosis that probably is a tumor with Herrera fusion. The clear cell ependymomas frequently have Herrera fusion. And um, it's, it's something to have in mind. It's not a 100% correlation, so um, but you can at least suggest it and give the chance, the opportunity for um, for testing.
So, this was an act of the anaplastic ependymoma. It satisfied criteria for, for anaplas anaplasia um, on its own and also was a, a clear cell. Case number eight is an 11 year old girl with a right hemispheric mass. Again, another supratentorial neoplasm. Very cellular, and again, a lot of pseudorosets. Here, the differential diagnosis, as in the posterior fossa case that I show you, um, is with an embryonal neoplasm. Fairly blue, a low power, a lot of pseudorosets. Some mitotic mitosis here and there. Also, so quite a few mitosis. So again, we are dealing with um, probably an anaplastic tumor. This field, you see several mitosis. And actually, this was an aplastic ependymoma, but this one was confirmed by next generation sequencing of ha having this rela fusion. So the morphology itself is not uh, specific for this uh, subtype. It's something that if you want to be definite and pull it, put it in that category, which is recognized by the WHO, you need to confirm it uh, in a molecular fashion. Uh, but at, at least something that you see here is that this tumor was anaplastic, uh, and that's something that you really can recognize by morphology criteria. And it was supratentorial. So many of these supratentorial tumors have, uh, particularly in young patients, have this uh, rela fusion, unfortunately. So, why is the importance of recognizing these molecular subtypes? Um, well, the, the importance here, this is again back from a commentary on this paper in 2015, in which you, there were these nine different categories of tumors. And you can see here the survival at five years on these patients. And it's almost 100% for most of the ependymomas. Again, as I mentioned, many of these ependymomas, in particular in the spinal cord, are surgical problems. They get resected and they don't really affect mortality very much. But there are two tumors that are groups here that really capture attention, which is this posterior fossa type A. I show you one of those cases and a supratentorial ependymoma with rela effusion that I just showed you. So you, these tumors you can see here that really show a drop in five year survival. So these uh, these are the two categories, molecular categories that, that drive essentially most of the mortality for ependymal tumors. That's why it's very important to recognize how common they are. Unfortunately, they are very common. And you see, if you look at the frequency of all these tumors across uh, the different types, these tumors uh, encompass about two thirds here of the of the cases you have. There are big important players: the posterior fossa type A and the supratentorial rela uh, rela fuse, particularly in young patients. So they do have a lot of the mortality. They're they're aggressive tumors, and for prognostic purposes, uh, are important to recognize. Moving into the next case is number nine. Uh, this uh, is a two-year-old girl with a hemispheric brain mass. Seeing again a very cellular neoplasm with uh, you have some lymphocytes, but also increased mitotic activity in some regions. 
my toe says very spindly here but in contrast to that tannicidic tumor this one is much more cellular and uh, very proliferative you have areas with pseudorosets here some nodules here of ependymal tumor And again, areas that are fairly spindly. This is a tumor we spent quite a bit of time with. It was a challenge when we saw it. This is the EMA, which also showed some dot-like positivity, but also some surface staining. So we were in the direction of something ependymal in some of the more epithelioid looking areas. It was GFAP positive as well. But something that was helpful in this case, uh, and that we still use for many in many different contexts, this is your reticulin staining. So there are areas here that are more convincingly ependymal that have uh, essentially not much for reticulin staining outside of the vessels, but then you have increased reticulin deposition in others. particularly here. So this is pedicellular reticulin deposition. And some of the more mesenchymal appearing regions. So actually we call this one ependymosarcoma. It's a, another group of tumors that it's not uh, yet recognized by the WHO. Uh, you can have a lot of mesenchymal or metaplastic changes in ependymoma that can be low grade. You can have cartilage sometimes. You can have areas that are spindly, as you can gather from the tannicidic patterns. Uh, but you do have cases in which the spindle cell component looks malignant and loses the ependymal properties and uh, develops a pericellar reticulin. And, and why, in, in some ways, I like to use this term is because it's important to separate these from your conventional gliosarcomas that are in which the more convincingly, the more or more frequently, the glial component is astrocytic and a diffuse glioma. And in those cases are associated, are essentially a subtype of glioblastoma. And you want to separate those from these ones. In our experience, we reported a series a number of years ago, actually, when I was a fellow, and we found that some tumors do poorly, but others can do actually well, even when they have histolytic malignancy after after surgery. So the outcome is less is more variable and less predictably poor as in, in contrast to uh, astrocytic tumors. Uh, these ones, of course, will be important to um, to study a bit better now with more modern techniques that we have, because we'll try we'll probably find out more about uh, how uh, different they are. Okay, let's uh, wrap up with case number 10. This is a 41-year-old woman that presented with an episode of aphasia. And this is the MRI. This is a well-circumscribed tumor in the hemisphere, kind of close to the cortex, a bit superficial.
This is the slide. You see it at low power, and again, you see a theme. You have these pseudo rosettes, and here actually the tumor is breaking down almost in pseudo papilla, very fragile pieces. Now, and here, if you go on the high power, you do see the pseudo rosettes, but and they are very conspicuous. At low power, right? But you see the cell processes that are a little bit broader. That's how we sometimes term these. The cells are a little plumper and the processes are broader. You don't have those fine, uh, almost fibrillary looking cell processes in this case. You can see here, they are broad cytoplasmic. Uh, processes of the cells. This is something you see here. Cells look a little plumper. You don't have that, that fibrillary pattern actually. You see the same thing here. I'm going to show you some stains. One of the first things that we did in this case was olic 2 and you can see here very strongly positive and that is something that when you see it you, is will be very atypical for uh, ependymoma. They tend to be olic 2 They are GFAB positive but most of the time they're olic 2 uh, negative. In this case this particular tumor is strongly olic 2 positive throughout. You have GFAP as well. So we are in the glioma camp here. Positive in some of these pseudorosettes, also positive in a large uh, subset of these interrosette uh, uh, tumor cells. Neurofilament protein. In some areas, you do have a bit of limited infiltration in some areas. EMA, not much for a doll like positivity, but more of these surface staining. And we did a variety of other markers here. Um, This one, we left it in the group of astroblastoma and gave it a WHO grade two based on uh, relatively low proliferation. This is a, has been always a controversial entity, but it's still recognized by the WHO. It's important to uh, be very critical when you make this diagnosis because you want to separate these. Uh, this is a pattern really that you can see in many different tumor types. You want to make sure first that it's not an ependymoma and second, that is not an infiltrating astro with an astroblastoma like pattern, basically having clinging around vessels, but really having a more conventional uh, infiltrating uh, tumor. This one had a few entrap axons, but we were uh, still okay, giving many other features to leave it in the astroblastoma category. What do we know about astroblastoma now? Uh, the message for astroblastomas is that basically it's an heterogeneous group. It's based on the morphology only. It's, um, it's a little bit, they are molecularly heterogeneous. Something that has uh, been elucidated in recent uh, years is that uh, many of them with their classic morphology actually have these MN1 uh, rearrangements. And when they have these, they tend to be associated with a, with a favorable prognosis. Uh, here is a one uh, uh, paper from uh, Dr. Orr and uh, Norman Lemon. And you can see that it, it, the heterogeneity of these tumors, you have some that have this MN uh, alteration. Some of them actually had Rela fish, uh, Rela positivity. So some of them probably are more identify more with these Rela fused ependymomas. And there's a subgroup also that has BRAF B600E. So you do have alterations in, in some subgroups that may point you more in the direction of a ependymoma or more of a, of a 
convincing astrocytic tumor. And this has been found also by other groups in which they have uh, some groups that have this BRAF B600E mutations. So molecularly heterogeneous, just be, uh, also be critical when you try to make this diagnosis. All right, so these are the cases. And as in other sessions, I will be now proceeding to uh, with some questions covering some of the, uh, to review some of the key uh, features of uh, that we have discussed. So question number one, uh, what is the immunohistochemical marker? Uh, is, is a useful surrogate for posterior fossa subgroup A ependymomas. Again, this is the subgroup that is associated with a worse prognosis. Uh, ASATRX, H3K27M, H3K27 trimethylation, IDH1, or synaptophysin. I'll give you a few minutes or a few, few moments to think about it. I think we have some C coming up. Okay. Oops, I'm sorry. So the yes, the actual uh, correct answer is C. This was moved on a little bit. Is C is loss of trimethylation. That's that correct one. C. H3K27 trimethylation is the correct answer. And I show you the stain, you have loss of it, and that actually in a posterior fossa, remember the, this, the, the location matters in the context, and children, this loss of trimethylation is a, is a good surrogate for this subgroup A that is associated with a worse prognosis. Uh, the H3K27M is actually recognizes the, the is a mutant specific antibody. You can see it occasionally in ependymomas, but it's really more of a marker of these diffuse midline gliomas that uh, are are uh, are different. So it's important to keep these two different. They have the same side, so it's a, sometimes a little confusing these two antibodies. It's really important to keep them separate. This recognizes the mutation. The K27M means that there's a mutation that that side, the trimethylation is an epigenetic mark, and that's the one that is relevant for these ependymomas. Question number two, 30 year old man presented with a circumscribed mass in the distal spinal cord. What ependymoma subtype is most likely? A is an aplastic ependymoma, B is clear cell, C is mixopapillary, D is papillary, and E is sub ependymoma. I think all are unanimous about C, mixopapillary ependymoma. Fantastic. Everybody's paying attention. So mix, uh, mixopapillary ependymoma is the case. Uh, many times they don't tell you that they're in the distal spinal cord. Sometimes they tell you that they're at the L1 or L2 level. Occasionally, this can be also associated with a nerve root. But as long as you recognize that this is really in the distal cord, sometimes it doesn't have to be in the spinal cord proper. This is the uh, it's actually more associated with the phylum nerve roots, that is the location where you're going to encounter these mixopapillary ependymomas. Question number three, what is the key diagnostic feature of subependymoma? A is cell clustering at low power, the presence of ependymal canals, parenchymal infiltration, pseudorosets, or rosenthal fibers. I can see A. Some are saying A, that is cell clustering at low power. That's right. So that is A, cell clustering at low power. So this is the key feature of subependymoma. You can see it's a low power diagnosis. You see a low power, you see these clusters in a very nice glial background. 
circumscribed to marine interventricular in an adult, and, and you essentially have your diagnosis. The other features, you don't see them. Ependymal canals, of course, is more of a feature of ependymoma, of conventional ependymoma. Parenchymal infiltration, you don't see much in these tumors. Pseudorosis, when you haven't, you can have a vague pseudorosis, but when you haven't well developed, you have to start thinking about these uh, subependymoma slash, uh, mix subependymoma slash ependymoma. And then horizontal fibers, uh, which uh, on rare occasions you have, can have many of these tumors. Uh, the final question is question number four. Which of the following morphologic features is most specific for a diagnosis of ependymoma? A, circumscribed architecture, B, low mitotic rate, C, oval uniform nuclei, D, pseudorosettes, E, rosettes slash canals. More people are saying pseudorosettes. That is D. Actually, the answer is A. So here is the most specific. So pseudorosettes is why we spend a lot of time talking about pseudorosettes because it's the most common feature. So it's more sensitive in some ways. If you want to use the language of sensitivity and specificity, you see it in most ependymal tumors. It's something that catches your attention. But what is most specific? You can see, again, pseudorosis, you see it in, in brinal tumors and astrocytic tumors. You can see it in other tumor types. But the presence in, in this context of a tumor that is, you recognize as phenotypically glial, and you start seeing these rosettes or these ependymal canals, when we talk about true rosettes with a lumen, uh, that is really most specific for a diagnosis of ependymoma. That's a, that's a point that I wanted to convey. Maybe it, 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 if we think about it in these terms, more specific, you don't see that outside of that context usually. And I think that's all I have for the moment. Um, uh, thanks very much for participating, being here early with us and, and the attention. Uh, feel free to continue uh, sending your questions uh, or contacting us with, more, uh, more, with, with other issues. Uh, and uh, at the end of this month, we are going to still have, we're going to be still in the same schedule. So at the end of this month, we're going to have another session in embrinal tumors, which is a, a challenging category of pediatric uh, neoplasms that uh, we'll try to have some very good representative examples in, in a, a very nice discussion. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, for this in depth discussion on the ependymal tumors. Maybe there is one quick question you might have time to answer so here is shimena i am not sure whether i am pronouncing it right so uh from guatemala the question is anaplasia is given by mitotic activity histologic pattern or pleomorphism which is more important mitotic activity as many other grading systems that we have Mitotic activity proliferation is your, the key feature that we use for grading. So pleomorphism, as I show you, I show you a case of a giant cell ependioma that has these real large bizarre cells in the spinal cord. That tumor is low grade. So the pleomorphism is oftentimes you see it in many different tumor types in the CNS, but the proliferation is what we use. Now, the grading systems for ependymomas are not as well established as for astro. So we, it's a little bit easier to correlate things. But when you have a tumor that has brief mitotic activity, and I tell you uh, quite a few, uh, that is really something that goes more with anaplasia in, in ependymomas and, and many other tumor types in the CNS. Thanks again, and thanks to all the viewers for joining in. We have so many viewers from different time zones that have joined. We had viewers from Myanmar, Bangladesh, uh, Baghdad, and so many other places. So as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned, the next lecture on this neuropath series is coming up on July 30th, when he will discuss uh, on this important topic of embryonal neoplasms in the CNS. And as always, feel free to follow our YouTube channel that is uh, Patcast, and I'll like our Facebook page and also subscribe to the newsletter that you can get access to on our website, that is pathologycast.com through the newsletter you would be able to 
have an update about all the upcoming lectures. And thank you so much, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you.